Hello and greetings from my home in Berkeley, California. Umberto Maturana, in my opinion, was one of the greatest biologists of the 21st century. His theory of autopoiesis and cognition, developed in collaboration with Francisco Varela, forms the very core of my synthesis of a new scientific understanding of life that has been developed at the forefront of science during the last 40 years. It provides a clear scientific answer to the age-old question, what is life? Maturana's and Varela's theory, now widely known as the Santiago theory, is based on three revolutionary insights. The first insight is to recognize the importance of the idea of a pattern of organization, that is a configuration of relationships characteristic of a particular system. During the 1960s, at a time when molecular biology was at the height of its success, Maturana realized that the defining characteristic of life is not embodied in certain molecular structures, but in a specific pattern of organization. Now, molecular biology and genetics are of course essential to understand biological life, but the same molecular structures will continue to exist when an organism dies. Whereas the pattern of organization is destroyed with the death of an organism. And so for Maturana, the understanding of life begins with the understanding of pattern. Together with the importance of pattern, Maturana recognized that the basic pattern of organization of all living systems is the network. And furthermore, that these living networks are self-generating. Maturana coined the Greek term autopoiesis, uh, which literally means self-making for this phenomenon. Now, the recognition of the self-generating nature of life for example, as we observe it in the turning of the seasons, is ancient knowledge. However, the identification of continual regeneration as the defining characteristic of life at the cellular level was first formulated by Maturana. In a cell, all the large molecules, the proteins, the DNA, and so on, are continually produced, repaired, and regenerated by the cellular network. And in this way, the network continually makes itself. It is produced by its component, by its components, and in turn produces those components. Similarly, at the level of a multicellular organism, the bodily cells are continually regenerated and recycled by the body's metabolic network. Living networks then continually regenerate themselves by transforming or replacing their components. And in this way, they undergo continual structural changes while preserving their web-like pattern of organization. And this coexistence of stability and change is indeed a key characteristic of life. Well, the third key idea of the Santiago theory 
and the one with the most radical philosophical implications is the characterization of the continual regeneration of living networks as cognitive processes. This implies nothing less than a new conception of the nature of mind, which overcomes the Cartesian division between mind and matter that has haunted philosophers and scientists for centuries. In the 17th century, René Descartes based his view of nature on the fundamental division between two separate and independent realms, that of mind, which he called the thinking thing, and that of matter, the extended thing. Following Descartes, scientists and philosophers continued to think of the mind as a thing, as some intangible entity. And they were unable to imagine how this thinking thing interacts with the body. Maturana's decisive advance was to realize that the mind is not a thing, but a process. The process of cognition, which in his view is closely associated with the process of life. And so life and cognition are inseparably connected. As Maturana put it succinctly, to live is to know. It is obvious that this represents a radical expansion of the concept of cognition and implicitly of the concept of mind. In the Santiago theory, cognition involves the entire process of life, including perception, emotion, and behavior. And it does not necessarily require a brain and a nervous system. Plants, for example, or even bacteria, neither of which have nervous systems, are constantly engaged in cognitive activities involving their sensory apparatus and various self-organizing processes. Now, the conceptual advance of the Santiago theory, of the Santiago view of cognition in particular, is easily appreciated by revisiting the thorny question of the relationship between mind and brain. This is an issue that has confused scientists and philosophers for centuries and still does. But in the Santiago theory, this relationship is simple and clear. The Cartesian characterization of mind as a thing is abandoned. Mind is not a thing, but a process. The process of cognition, which is associated with the very process of life. The brain is a particular structure through which this process operates. The relationship between mind and brain, therefore, is one between process and structure. Moreover, the brain is not the only structure through which cognition operates. The entire structure of the organism participates in the process of cognition whether or not there is a brain and a nervous system. Now, many details of the Santiago theory of autopoiesis and cognition still remain to be clarified. However, we now have the outlines of a scientific theory, which for the first time overcomes the Cartesian division of mind and matter that has haunted Western science and philosophy 
for 300 years. Mind and matter no longer appear to uh, belong to separate categories, no longer appear to be separate entities, as Descartes believed, but can be seen as representing two complementary aspects of the phenomenon of life, process and structure. At all levels of life, beginning with the simplest cell, mind and matter, process and structure are inseparably connected. For the first time, we have a scientific theory that unifies mind, matter, and life. In my opinion, this has been Umberto Maturana's greatest achievement. And finally, I would like to mention that in my discussions with Umberto, I was not only impressed by his intellectual brilliance, but also very touched by his affectionate demeanor. He always treated me as a good friend, a dear friend whom he was happy to see. Over the last 30 years, his work has had a decisive influence on my scientific thought and writing. And the memory of his warmth and great humanity will stay with me forever. Thank you. <laughs>